first speaker for the motion is Will Self. And so Will Self is now going to be walking over to the podium while this is being said about him. In case you never heard of Will Self, he is uh, very tall, uh, walks in a very strange way. He's also, when he's not walking in a strange way, a novelist, a broadcaster, a political commentator, and a literary critic. His most recent novels are, not that I need to tell you because you've read them all, Umbrella, Shark and Phone, and his memoir, Will, was published in November 2019, and Will holds the chair in contemporary thought at Brunel University, no less. And the clock, Will, has started. Ah, men and women. Let's not talk about ladies and gentlemen this evening. The actual motion is there's not much great about Britain, but it's a pretty coy way of alluding to what we're going to be discussing, which is, does Great Britain as an entity have any psychic purchase on us anymore? Do we think in terms of Great Britain? What's meant by Great Britain? Well, we're obviously not going to sort of look into the etymology of the term and tell you that uh, after the Romans left Britain and some ancient Britons went to Brittany, they started alluding to the place from which they had come as Grand Brittany. We're not going to refer to that. Uh, I think we all know from the front of our passports, if we're subjects of the Queen, that it says there, Great Britain... Uh, the Union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So that draws our attention to the Union of 1707 with Scotland. I'm not really much concerned with Wales. <laughs> I like Christopher Logue's Clara Hugh, when all else fails, try Wales. <laughs> uh, so I'm not gonna concentrate on that. Nor do I want to particularly get bogged down in issues of, of patriotism uh, and nationalism and, and attitudes towards belonging to the nation. In part, and, and Anthony was right about this, we were all getting on famously in the green room. Uh, very, very cuddly in there, a lot of Snapchatting and stuff like that. And uh, it, it's really out of respect for the opposing team, who, uh, you know, Saeed Awasi, very distinguished politician, uh, and Kate Hoey, my own uh, former MP, a little bit demob happy possibly now she's left the House of Commons. But between them, many, many years of exemplary public service, service for what I presume they think of as, as Great Britain. And I don't wish to impugn that personally. Uh, of course, you might think that, that uh, Ms. Hoey, uh, who, who is often been a, a strong advocate of the right to uh, hunt foxes, somewhat strange in a, in a Labour MP, is in a way hearkening back with her championing of this pursuit to a slightly medieval conception of our nation and its culture and mores, uh, a slightly feudal conception, uh, a conception that, 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 that belongs uh, as well with that idea so, so fond uh, to which uh, the, the medieval monarchs and, and the baronry were so fond of, which is that might is right. Might is right. And, and I think that that idea is bound up in, in Great Britain, the idea of might being right. So it could be that Ms. Hoey is, is, oppo is, is opposing this motion because of that, uh, because of the fox hunting. Uh, and as for, for, for Baroness Wasi, Baroness? What's that about? Baroness. Uh, you know, I mean, does she go hunting or hawking? Or has she got some sort of estate? Does she occasionally clip-clop around it and look at some peasants <laughs> groveling in the mud and say, get on with it, you peasants? Uh, because I would say that if you style yourself as a Baroness, you probably also have a lurking belief in the idea that might is right. So, I don't want to impugn them or their reasons for supporting the motion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I simply want to draw everybody's attention to what the focus is here, Great Britain. Great Britain styled itself great when it was the hegemon, the most powerful nation in the world. And like all hegemons, Great Britain believed that its value system was an objective system of morality. Its might was indeed right, okay? Do we still live in that country? Manifestly, we do not. We do not. Just think, for example, of the longest deployment that the British Army has ever been engaged in. I refer to the deployment in Afghanistan following 9-11. In 14 years in theater, I think I'm right on this, the British Army suffered 500 fatalities, okay? The British Army suffered that many fatalities in five minutes during the first four hours of the Battle of the Somme. The willingness of the British to sacrifice their young men, and it was mostly young men, but some young women as well, upon the altar of being the hegemon is manifestly no longer the case. And indeed, to hear the public conversation about the losses of those 500 service people, you'd think that you lived in a very, very small, touchy-feely Scandinavian country, not in a hegemon at all. The other thing is, I, I recently, I've been working, they were name-checked before, on a trilogy of novels that focus on Britain's wars over the past century. And as part of that research, I interviewed senior British Army officers who told me that they now regard themselves, this is the command of the British Army, as an echelon of the American Army, a bit like the United States Marine Corps. They have to be interoperable with the American forces and they cannot deploy uh, by themselves, not what you think of in a hegemon. I put it to you that the reason we're even debating this tonight is that Britain has a kind of hegemon hangover that leads it to believe it still has hegemonic attributes. Are we as powerful as our status as one of the world's six biggest economies would really suggest? What does our economy consist on? What do we in fact export? Well, we export some death metal, that's true, often to quite unpleasant regimes like Bahrain or Israel. Cool, well done Britain, great. But the other thing we tend to, to do and make a great deal of money out of is a kind of financial Ponzi scheme. It's the city of London, the equivalent in economic terms of taking money out of the cash point with your own cash card and running around to the bank to put it in your own account. That's what we're engaged in. That's what makes Britain great, is that kind of economics. Oh yeah, and exporting things like you know, great famous British brands like Burberry and Barber. You know, they're normally showcased in things like The Queen, right? <laughs> the the, the uh, Netflix series which bears absolutely no relation to our royal family whatsoever. I am indeed a concerned citizen of this country and as such I am a foilist rather than a royalist. I liked Claire Foy in the role of the Queen much better than I like Olivia Coleman, and much better than I like the actual queen, <laughs> who has a penchant for her thickest friend of pedophile's son. So, not much there to look to in terms of greatness. And then there's culture. To what extent is British culture still great? After all, I hold a British passport, I'm a writer, I operate in that culture. It may surprise you to hear this from me, who you may think of as a sort of touchy-feely, lefty typey person. But my way of thinking is one of the problems that British culture has is a problem that a lot of Western cultures have, which is it tries to embrace multiculturalism. But there's a contradiction in terms there. A culture is a vector that carries forward a set of values. In this case, it would have to be carrying forward, if we're to be, still be this Great Britain, those hegemonic values that we had when the sun never set on our empire. But on the other hand, we want to acknowledge the values of all these other diverse minorities in our culture. 
there's an inherent contradi contradiction there. I would like this country to respect the rights of all minorities, but I don't think that that necessarily Put involves it in having the kind of great British culture that it used to have. We can see, therefore, that Britain might not be as great as it was. I haven't spoken much about the thing that is happening on Friday. I myself was a Brexit agnostic. We will see what's happened, but the damage was done ages ago. The flotilla of Britishness was holed below the waterline. <laughs> the thing about the British was, unlike other nations and national cultures, they never believed in utopia, but they did believe in Uchronia. They believed in a time that never was, a merry England, one in which Kate could hunt foxes, and Saida could style herself a baroness, and everything was just cushy. Thank you.